Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 78 of Two Goalies, One Mike. I'm Johnny Cullen, back after an upper body injury, uh, joined by Dwayne Steinella, as always. Um, we have a special guest coming up for you. I'll let Dwayne break that one down. Uh, get uh, back in the saddle, though. Absolutely. Uh, what upper body injury, buddy? Just, uh, ge- just general, me being just out general, of shape. Just you being out of shape, I got gotcha. you. You know, I... I Dealt with a lot of full body injuries after Thanksgiving dinner last night that caused me to go into a coma on my uncle's couch. So do you have a good Thanksgiving? Wonderful. Uh, yeah. You know, it's different being a parent. Um, but luckily the kids found their, 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 my, my two kids found themselves into a food coma as well. So that made uh nighttime a lot easier. So no, it was a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thanks for right. having, right. asking and I uh, hope, Hope all of our listeners out there had a had a good day with their family as well. Yep, yep. And without further ado, uh, you know, here we go. This is our guest for this evening from the Steve Dangle Podcast Network, Andrew Berkshire. <laughs> How's it going, Andrew? I'm doing great. I mean, honored to be compared to one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. I wasn't. I wasn't sure if uh, you were uh, a, a big wrestling guy. Um, we did that once with Greg Wyshynski from ESPN. Uh, I did it with uh, the Adam Cole entrance music. Uh, he's a big AEW guy, and I just like to try and have fun sometimes. So, uh, oh, with our you know mediocre uh, production team here, we were able to put that together in about like five minutes before the show. Yeah, I'm not the hugest wrestling fan anymore, but I definitely grew up with it, loved it when I was a kid yeah. into like teenage years. I actually have uh, Eric Young coming on the podcast for oh, no the way. Predators game coming up, so that's going to be really fun. That, that'll that be exciting, man. Like I said, I'm a big mark myself. Uh, I grew up on WWE. I was very loyal, never watched WCW. I wouldn't do it. And now uh, you have a new, uh, you know, not Monday Night Wars, but you have the AEW brand going head to head with WWE, which has been exciting. It's a good time to be a wrestling fan for sure. But uh, thanks for coming on with us, man. I really do appreciate this. I had a lot of fun with you with your podcast, Game Over with uh, uh, the, the Steve Dangle Podcast Network. A uh, ton of fun with you. And uh, I was at Brock McGillis and uh, had a great time. Yeah, it was really fun. It was uh, kind of had some fun after a pretty crappy game, which has been the story of the season so far, unfortunately, for the Montreal Canadiens. But I think they're kind of in the same situation as Buffalo right now. Both teams are just in free fall. And the, the Sabres started the season, you know, exciting and looking like maybe they'd make something out of it. And they've kind of ruined that in a short order. And the Canadians started out terrible and just have not gotten any better. Yeah, looking at the, you know, the coming into tonight's matchup, obviously the Sabres uh, started out the season getting the, the, the five to one win over the Canadians, um, but both mired in the in the basement of that Atlantic division. And, and I, I think it's safe to say that goaltending has been an issue for both teams. Um, I'm I, in spite of Dwayne, I'm a big Craig Anderson guy. Love it. His his upper body injury, that's why I started the show off with that, Dwayne. That's kind yeah. of you know, you go back to that and and now now we have two I say friendly fringe NHL probably replacement AHL goaltenders at Dikarski and Dell. Um, and they haven't done us any favors. You know, both teams have, have shared in their woes of, of the goaltending issues. Um, and I feel like we'd be remiss as a goaltending podcast to not talk about that. So, um, Andrew, your feelings about what's been going on there, obviously Carey Price, you know, great, great to see him, you know, back, you know, at least released a statement that he's, you know, kind of back with the team and in a better mental state. I give him all the credit in the world for, you know, being the man that he is to come out and, uh, you know, kind of fight that, that stigma against, you know, you know, sick, not weak. And, um, so, I'm sure, you know, when he, whenever he feel deems himself ready to come back into the lineup, that'll be great. But, you know, I, I was really impressed with Jake Allen a year ago. 
Uh, even before the season, the season started, uh, Dwayne, you remember, I was yep. singing the praises, Bergevin's praises for that pickup. I think it was, uh, you know, not talked about too much at the time, but what a great move. But, but like you said, he struggled a bit too. Um, so what's been going on in Montreal that, that, that you think is, is led to some of those goaltending inefficiencies, let's call them. Yeah, I mean, Jake Allen is a guy who, if he's not relied on every night, I think has great potential. And he's played some very great games so far this season. But the issue is when Jake Allen gets overworked and overtired, he starts doing a thing where he'll give you one good game and then one awful game and then one okay game and then one awful game and then one great game. So it's like you don't actually know what you're going to get every night. And it's not like the Canadians have made it easy on him. They've been really terrible. Uh, he's gotten almost no goal support the entire season. I think all of his wins, he's allowed either one or fewer goals. Like he's got two shutouts and allowed one goal in his other two wins, which is nuts. Like you just can't sustain that over the course of a season. Like if you're expected to keep the goal total below two in order to win, like the pressure is just massive. And I think it shows like, how mentally strong Carey Price has been, uh, regardless of the substance abuse issue that apparently he's been dealing with for the last three seasons before checking into the player assistance program. To be able to do this, playing 60 plus games for the Montreal Canadiens in a market that is more critical of their players than anywhere else in the world for hockey, and not blink, you know, and to put out consistent performances almost every single year it really gives you a lot of respect for a player like that and a person like that. And Jake Allen is suffering through it right now. I think that the last couple of games kind of don't sum up, or I guess not the last couple. He's had a couple of good games before, uh, before he went down to injury, but the last game probably hurts his numbers a lot more than like he deserves. Uh, He had a rough game against Vegas as well, where they barely got any shots. And then every, uh, opportunity they got ended up being a perfect scoring chance. So there's, he's not been great, but he has been decent. Like in the games that they have won, he's been first or second star. Like it's hard to evaluate him, honestly, because this isn't what he was brought in to do. Yeah. He's like you said, he's a perfect one B, right? Yeah. Like the one A, one B. And we saw that last season in their trip to the cup finals. Um, What's interesting to me is, is Sam Montem. Montembeau, am I saying that right? Yes. You know, it, he's coming off his first win. That was over, what, a week ago against Nashville? Yes. And then you guys, you know, Allen comes back in against Washington with a, you know, a six-goal performance. I know Washington's been playing some really good hockey. Um, I don't know if it's been released yet, but do you know which way uh, Ducharme's leaning tonight? Do you know who's getting the nod in the pipes? I would assume that it's Allen just because he's the de facto number one. And I think that uh, like he had a couple of goals that went by him in the Washington game that probably should have had. But for the most part that the scoring was just like the Canes were terrible. Like the breakdowns were horrendous. So I would assume that he goes back to Allen because it's, it's one thing to kind of go back and forth between goalies. If you're in a situation where like the goalies are on even footing and if one guy has a bad game, you go to the other guy. But if you're going to flip Allen out of the net right now when he's just coming back from injury, when it wasn't really his fault necessarily that they allowed six goals, I feel like that starts to create confidence issues. And I don't think they want to do mind games with Jake Allen when they don't have clarity on how long Carey Price is going to be out. I, I, I can't agree with you more there, Andrew. Like you mentioned before, playing in a, in a city like Montreal – uh, not to mention, I don't, I can't, I don't think you mentioned his contract as well for Carey Price. It's like, you know, you have all that, all eyes on you, essentially. You know, and I've said this to Cully, and I, I know Cully, you've agreed with me in the past. I think one of the toughest positions in all of sports, well, two of the toughest positions of all sports are goaltender and pitcher, a pitcher in baseball, because the game can be won and lost, just honestly, for five bad minutes from you. You know what I mean? Like, whereas in football, you I mean you could you could have a bad drive, but you can get right back into it the following drive. Like goaltender has a bad five minute span. Got teams go four for five, you know, pump four goals by him in five minutes, and you just create you know, you know, cr- create a hole for your team that they can't really you know dig yourself out of. Same thing with a pitcher. A pitcher can have a bad inning and give up nine runs, and 
same same situation, extremely difficult hole to get out of. And not to mention the $10 million contract that, you know, Montreal signed him to. Um, and again, just obviously we weren't aware, not that we should have been, that he was dealing with these substance issues. But I'm just really happy that in a guy in his situation where the world, the hockey world is always like kind of looking at him as and carrying that weight on his shoulders of being one of the best, if not the best goaltender in the world for how, I don't know how many years, uh, just, you know, be able to, find, you know, that he's, you know, accepted that he has, he has, he has a problem. He needs to seek help and he put that first. So, you know, a couple of clicks for Carey Price because, for you know, sure. it, it, especially in a, it, again, in a city like Montreal to do that coming off a year where you appeared in the Stanley cup finals, that says a lot about his character and just, you know, the strength that he has as, uh, as an individual. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Really quick, very quick. Sorry. It just, uh, just able to confirm the Sabres will see Montembeau tonight. Uh, oh, really? Oh, I uh, think that's a horrible decision by the coaching staff. Yeah. And pretty reliable source coming from Renat Lavoie uh, for TVA sports up there that covers the Habs. He's done a good job. It's not something floating around there. So, think it's pretty safe to say that Montebello will be in that. Um, and I he, guess the other thing we have to consider is the Canadians play tomorrow as well, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it is a back-to-back. So I guess giving Jake Allen the Hockey Night in Canada game makes a little bit of sense. So we'll, I'll, I'll delay my criticism of that. Hey, I have a yeah. quick question. What was, was Cole Caulfield down in the AHL for that stint coming back from injury or what was that about? Did you, do you know? That was straight up about performance. Um, I think he was getting better before they sent him down, but I think it was that his confidence had taken a hit from not scoring for the entire season. I think he went like 10 straight games before he got sent down and they were just trying to get him going a little bit and send him down to the American hockey league to try to dominate a little. And yeah. he seems to be looking a little bit better. No, oh, they yeah. got him penciled in with Suzuki and drew in on that. I don't know if you want to call it the first line, but yeah, that's the top uh, line. That's the top hoping, line. Hope, hoping he doesn't get his confidence back tonight. Hopefully, the <laughs> Sabers can can find a way to to, to find find a way to get two points. Uh, it's been tough. <laughs> well, we've uh, eight, I, we've had AHL goaltending, you know, since you know uh, Craig Anderson went down, and I've said it a couple times on Twitter. I think that if you have even just you know average to below average NHL goaltending on this team right now, you could probably you know chalk up three to four more wins for Buffalo, but we haven't had that. It's been, it's been pretty pitiful to say the least. Um, I was, I was treated to, to a great game. I don't know if either of you two watched it today. Um, well, the kids were down for a nap. I was able to take in the Rangers Bruins game. And I saw the best highlight from it. Yeah. So did I. <laughs> Oh, the, the save from no, uh, Panarin, Panarin throwing his glove oh, at Marshall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just, I loved it. How uh, I'm going to AJ Malesko. Uh, she was the one between the glass, like how Razor is for us. And like, she was right in the middle of that. So just to hear her breakdown of it was kind of funny. Um, no, but I, I was just going to point out like um, Swayman is a young guy, right? He made a great paddle, you know, desperation save. It's a low percentage save. Um, but we were just treated to um, two good goal t- goalies, and Shosturkin played really well. In my mind, he is, if not the best young up and coming goaltender in the in the game today. I don't know who else is, uh, but he's really impressed me. Um, and it just feels like the, it's been so long for the Sabers um, that we've had somebody like that. And, and I know, listen, I know Craig Anderson isn't that guy, but it was exciting to see the start that he had with a four and two record and the 2.5 goals against average. Those are average numbers. And, but that's, that's, that's our life here in Saberland and the past 10 years to get excited about. So um hoping Tukarski can get, get, get the win tonight and, um, you know, deny Montebello his, his second victory. Um, but you know, it's two teams looking, looking to get out of that basement in the Atlantic. I know the Sabres have, I think yeah, maybe three two, games points, in hand. two, two, two or three games in hand and, and a couple points ahead, but, um, you know, the Sabres are, are finding a way to, you know, what's sad. I wanted to bring this up never before. And I know COVID has something to do with it. The border has something to do with it. Even through all those bad years, we still had a pretty full arena. And, and now to see the 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 Key Bank Arena so empty, uh, national it's pundits sad. have even started to say stuff about it. It's just it's and sad I, it, to going back to you know. And Rick Jenner, that's last year too, Cully. That's yeah, what's even more just, sad. 
it hurts. It, it sucks. And, um, you know, the future is bright. Um, love to see what Quinn, Paterka, and those guys are doing uh, in the minors. And, you know, obviously having Owen Power coming back. But um, I, I'm, I'm a Don Granado fan. I, Andrew, from, from, from your perspective, um, do you see a difference in the way the Sabres are playing? Obviously, we, we lead the league with uh, the amount of guys on – uh, the league minimum seven hundred fifty thousand dollar contracts, but do you, do you see the Sabers going in the right direction for for not being a Sabers fan or for being somebody outside the market? Um, you know, what, what is your perspective on on what Don Granado has been able to do since um, the Ralph Kruger firing and uh, obviously since you know the start of the season? Well, I haven't watched a lot of their games this year, but of the ones that I did watch, more of them were earlier in the season, so my perspective is a little bit biased, right? Because uh, I know that by the underlying numbers, the Sabres have been tanking pretty hard over the last little stretch. But early in the season, I liked what Don Granato was doing. I thought that uh, tactically, the Sabres were far more in tune than they've been at any time in recent years. I liked how aggressive they were in the neutral zone. I liked how creative their forwards were allowed to be, how much their defense was able to jump into the play. So, like, there's good things in there. It's just like, at a certain point, like you said, leading the league in the number of guys on minimum contract, that kind of stuff is going to come back and you're not going to have the ability to sustain being able to outplay teams with way bigger salaries on their like salaried uh, rosters, right? Way more star power, way more depth, uh, way more guys who are ready. The Sabres are still in the process of yet another rebuild, right? So yeah. it's frustrating and I feel like that the fact that people aren't coming to the game in droves in Buffalo is extremely sad because it's one of the most loyal markets in the league. Yes. You're not wrong. You know, and to see how far you have to push things from an ownership perspective to break the trust or break the relationship with enough people to not have people banging on the doors to get into those games. Like you have to really hand it to the Bagulas that they they worked hard to to wreck it, right? I think they'll be fine long term because there are people in place in that organization now who are going to turn that around. I think Sam Ventura is a brilliant guy, one of the main reasons why the Penguins were able to win back to back cups. I think that's going to be like the start of something special in Buffalo. It's just going to take time, and that arena will be full before long. That's the name I was actually going to say when you when you when you were you were getting into that with Sam Ventura. That was such a good hire for What's Buffalo. And, you know, uh, he's a um, I'm sorry, he's he's their lead analytics guy. Uh, he okay. you know he um, when it comes. I remember to when they hired him. I just wasn't sure what yeah. his exact title yeah. was. I, I, it, it escapes me too. But he's like their lead analytics guy. Um, and, and, but just, just with that being said, it's uh, it has. I when we talked about it in game over when I when I was on with you is one of the biggest things I've noticed you know since the start of the season is they're not getting beat all the time in the neutral zone they are winning a lot of battles you know and they they do come to play they're prepared from puck drop you know under Ralph Kruger I mean Cully how many times the media of the conversation it was just like do these guys remember they had a game tonight like are they just playing shinny hockey like this is terrible to watch like they just like they looked like you know they you know, we're out all night last night. They weren't ready to go. That's night and day difference here in our Granado. I think that's the biggest difference uh, for, for me, at least. No, um, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed seeing the jam that they play with. You know, it's not that like, like you said, it, it's, they're, they're allowed to play within a system that doesn't limit them. That doesn't, that allows them to still play with their skill, to still play creatively and, you know, not with one hand tied behind their back, which we saw a lot throughout the Ralph Kruger era. Uh, one interesting note I wanted to bring up, I heard recently, I was listening to Elliot Friedman um, just to stir the pot a bit, but, you know, it was brief, but he said Buffalo has to be looking uh, for a goalie. He notes that Aaron Dell has, has had a terrible season getting pulled recently um, and, and without that return date for Craig Anderson, because it seems like it's been day to day to week to week to, you know, um, just just his his main quote was, you know, the Sabres need somebody there to to support their their younger players. Um, and the problem is though is who's out there. There's just not a ton of goaltenders available. You know, outside of the Mark Andre Fleury's, who you, you expect to maybe go closer to the deadline to a team like Edmonton or somebody that's looking to make a run. 
Uh, and teams aren't willing to part with their, their their young goaltenders coming in. And and I don't think we need a young goaltender, you know, maybe, but just somebody like a stop, uh, like a stop like a uh, you know, plug, stop plug. I don't know what the word, if I'm using gap, it correctly. Gap, stop gap. Yeah, stop gap, yeah, gap, stop stop gap. gap. There it is. Too many pucks to the head for this guy. Um, yeah, right. What are your guys' thoughts on that? I know it's it's tough. Like, no names come to mind for me uh, that would, would fill that role. It's just – it really hurts to see – you know, some of these young guys, you know, us playing ourselves into games only to be out of the game because of poor starts from goaltending. Yeah, it's going to be harder than ever before because the game's changed a lot. And now you see teams that need two good goaltenders instead of one, right? We're past the era of the 70 game playing goaltender. We're now at the 1A, 1B portion. So even if a team is stocked full of goalies, they're not going to be willing to give them up easily because. They need two really good ones at all times. And that's like you saw the situation with the New York Rangers with Georgiev, right? They were asking the moon for him, even though Shesterkin was the guy who was going to come in and overtake him. So it's going to be tough. But I got a header, guys. I, I, uh, thanks for hopping on with us, Andrew. I know you, uh, like I said, sounds like your kids are causing a ruckus over there. But yes. real quick, if you don't mind, just giving us a quick prediction for tonight. Uh, I think it's going to go to overtime. And I don't know. At that point, it doesn't really matter who wins because it's unpredictable anyway. Three on three and shootout are both a crapshoot. All right. All right. Well, thanks for hopping on with us, Andrew. Hopefully we can have you on again sometime soon. Uh, really appreciate you hopping on. Absolutely, guys. See you later. Thanks, Andrew. Yep. Cully, you know, so, you know, uh, guy's an absolute beaut. I love, uh, you know, I've been talking with Andrew a little bit here now to get him out of the show. Uh, you know, definitely check his uh, podcast out. He's got a couple different podcasts, but the, the one, uh, you know, he's running – run out of most of right now is game over with the Steve Dangle podcast network. Uh, after every Montreal Canadiens game, win or lose, he usually has a pretty cool guest on. So make sure you guys check that out um, at Andrew Berkshire on Twitter. So, um, but you know, Johnny, you know, tonight, like you said, we have, uh, I, I can't pronounce his last name. What's the goal. What's the goalies with Montreal's last name? Mountain blue, mountain blue, mountain blue. And yeah, I was looking. I was looking up these numbers. Montembeau. Yeah, Montembeau. Yeah, I, was, I was looking up obviously Jake's numbers. I know he's dealing with the injury. And then his numbers, like they don't have a single goalie out of their three that have started that have a goals against that's below three right now. Uh, not not good uh, for the Montreal Canadiens. You know they're dealing with a lot of the same issues that we're dealing with right now as Sabres fans. Uh, not good at all. But um, with that being said, you know obviously outside of you know the the lack of winning here in Buffalo, we've seen a lot of fun stuff coming out of Rochester with uh, post uh, Jack Uckle trade from Pey- Peyton Krebs. He's finally starting to gel there with Jack Quinn and JJ Paterka. Uh, Owen Power looks to be leading the way and maybe the Hobie Baker talk in Michigan. The kid has been absolutely on a tear. I think he has already over 20, 20 or more points already in a, a very young uh, Michigan season. Just, um, you know, how are you feeling about the future of this team, Johnny, outside of what you've already mentioned? I, I think it's bright. I just think that, um, you know, one of the three goalies that uh, me and you have talked about off air has to, you know, pan out. I think between UPL, he's obviously the closest, um, you know, then you got Portillo and then you got uh, uh, Diva, Devon Levi. Devon um, Levi, yeah. Yeah. Devon or Devon. Um, yeah, one of them has to pan out because that's yeah. been a whole ever since Ryan Miller left. Um um, so I, I love the way that Granado has been coaching these young guys. I think another reason too, you look at, you look at, um, you know, the Sabres home record is five, five and one, um, against their, their two, five and one, uh, away record. Like, and that's with nobody in the stands, um, really liked what I've seen from Tage Thompson and an interesting quote from oh, Donald Granado the other day was, he was asked, you know, how good can he be? What's his ceiling? And and he says, I don't even think, you know, Tage knows his ceiling. Cause, and that was really cool for me to hear because there's a guy that we got back in one of the most lopsided trades. And, you know, he was probably the key piece in one of the worst trades that the Sabres have ever made. Um, and I know that's not a Kevin Adams thing, but, um, you know, he's been playing really, really well. And, and to see, like you mentioned, um, Krebs, you know, start to gel with Quinn and and Paterka, them playing so well, and then the Owen Power and 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 dominating with Michigan. Um, I've been able to 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 follow along as a view has been fun to watch. Um, but I think the middle stat lineup 
hurts hurts more than we think it does. Um, and and with Olaf see Olaf's Olafson being out too. Uh, I go back to Granado's uh, words, you know, he says, just having guys like that come back, you know, it bumps a guy like Asplund down a line, which bumps a guy like Kinnestrosa down a line and, and so on and so forth. And, and although that, you know, Casey Middlestat hasn't lived up to our, you know, expectations, he's, he's been better and better, especially ever since, you know, Kruger was fired. So, um, you know, I know he's still considered week to week, but, the Sabers said that he 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 has skated alone um, prior to the team's morning skate today, which is a positive sign. Um, I don't think we'll see him against the Red Wings in Detroit, um, but maybe hopefully Monday we can see Middlestat back in the lineup. That's the optimist in me. Um, so I, I just for me that that's the that's the important thing. Like to gauge this team, uh, are they a contending team? No. Uh, did they have a, a, a better start to the season than I expected? Yeah. Uh, obviously the woes go back to the goaltending, but I think the future is bright. And when, Dwayne, I wanted to ask you on air, cause we talked about this off the air. When's the last time that we've been excited about, you know, the, 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 the Rochester Americans and the success that they're having. Since um, the lockout, since the yeah, lockout, right? Your, your answer was that year where they had, you know, Vanek, Briere, Drury, Miller, like all of those key pieces that were a part of the runs that we made. Um, so it's, it's just fun. That part of it's fun for me. Um, Granado even said him and Kevin Adams, you know, they, 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 what he, Granado says he watches all the games. Um, and he was able to get down to one of the games, uh, one of the past Fridays with Kevin Adams and, and, um, I had nothing but good things to say about those guys. So, I mean, well, I think you look with, with the, you know, I, I know serious fans don't want to hear this, you know, the, the one to two to three year outlook. I think that, you know, you'll, you'll like what you'll see and, 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 and what we have coming through. Um, it's just for me, you know, finding a way to get replacement level NHL goaltending on a nightly basis. And I think if we had that, I think this team is, is easily, easily, three, four points at least better than they are right now. Do I, do I care that much? No, because at the end of the day, I think we're still playing for a draft pick, but fuck, wouldn't it be fun to see this team sneak into the playoffs? You know, just, just at the right time, getting these young guys, at least a round of experience. Um, so by the time next year rolls around, Dwayne, when we add those other pieces, if they're ready, that uh, we can say, hey, that that playoff drought's over, kind of similar to what we went through with the Bills. We knew when Tyrod led them to the playoffs that year and they broke the drought, they weren't going to win the Super Bowl. But, you know, here we are four or five years later where, you know, they are or they were considered Super Bowl contenders. Two different sports. I know I'm splitting hairs there, but just, I don't know. Th- th- those are my thoughts, your thoughts on that and 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 what, I guess, my, my main point about Middlestat returning to lineup and, and how he can help, you know, push more talent down the roster. And, and, you know, that means that, you know, um, cousins is now getting probably their third pair. Once Middlestat's back instead of their second, the opposing team's second pair. And I, I just think that'll open up more room for, for our talented young players. You're not wrong. I, I, I've, I've, it was exciting to see, uh, you know, Joker, you know, Yoki Haru get back in this lineup. Um, but the, I think the body we're all waiting to see get back in the lineup, I know he's skating with the team again, is obviously Casey Middlestat because it gives you, like you said, it gives you so much more flexibility up and down your lineup, especially down the middle. Um, and I think right now, as terms of center goes, I think I think Casey's probably your best 200-foot player. 100%. Um, you know, he's come a long way under Don Granado. You saw shades of it last year, even under Ralph Kruger. Uh, defensively, he became a better player. And I think as much as the bad things we had to say about Ralph Kruger, I think there are a few good things that we got out of him. You know, he did he did help maybe develop Casey Middlestat into becoming a more complete player. But I think he's going to thrive so much more under Don Granado. And getting him back in is going to be key to us winning more games outside of the obvious, which is getting better NHL-level goaltending. Um, and let's not forget Alex Tuck. He's month to month, but, you know, he's uh, – you know. Uh, I want to say he had that surgery done in July. 
uh, a few months removed from that shoulder surgery. I know it was a six month rehab, uh, you know, healing process. So we do expect to see Alex Tuck at some point down the road here. And that guy, that guy is not, not just going to bring a lot of skill to your lineup, bring a lot of size, you know, leadership. a lot of jam and leadership. Leadership is the big one. Do, could you, do you think you could put the, the C on a guy like Alex Tuck? You know, yeah, but as not, early as next not, season. Not right now, but, but as early as next could, season. Yeah, I could. But it just all depends on, on what happens inside those walls. Um, you know, you're obviously gonna, you know, put it on one of the one of the young guys that younger guys that has you know commitment to this team. Um, it'll be interesting to see if if we're able to work out an extension. I know Tuck still has a, a year or two, uh, a few years left on his deal. Um, so you know, he'll be here. But just going back to his opening presser was exciting, you know, to to see how uh, how excited he was, you know, being a Sabres fan, you know, right down in the ninety and growing up in Syracuse, and um, you know, I def yeah to answer your question, yeah, I think he's he's got to be in the running, and that's crazy to say without him even playing a game yet. But when when you bring that up, I mean, just staring at their lineup right now, adding in a top six piece like Tuck, once middle stats back. You know that it just makes our our lineup look so much better. And instead of having John Hayden and, and you know a a, a a very you know a Cody Eakin or a, a Hinnestronas in a lineup, you know maybe you're looking at Anders Borg, Zemgus Gergesons, and Rasmus Asplund as your fourth line, or Bjork, Gergen, and Poso as your fourth line. And Asplund's having that, himself you know, a season too. I yeah, think he had like twelve point. points. That's why I corrected myself just because he's on that third line right now. Um, I think right now you're playing without, you know, two with middle stat and tuck. I think you're playing without two of your bet, your bet, your best players, definitely two of your top six players. So to see them come back, it'll be really interesting. Um, I hope it's sooner rather than later. I know that talk rehabbing from that shoulder, shoulder surgery is no joke. You know, it is a strict six months at the minimum. Um, it's not like other injuries where guys can really just, hop ahead in that process, but you really want to rehab that the right way. So it, it isn't something that you have to do every couple of years. Uh, it is a tough AC joint um, labrum surgery. So um, one thing I want to ask you about Colin Miller, um, somebody that you mentioned uh, on the phone with me the other day that has been playing better and better hockey. Um, and I just wanted to Maybe have you maybe repeat what you said to me. I don't know if you remember on the phone. Do you remember what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, um, I think Colin Miller is the type of guy who, um, if he keeps up at this pace that he's at right now, I don't see why you couldn't get yourself a, uh, you know, a a first round pick for him at the deadline. And I'm I'm being so serious about that, Cully, because, um, w- you know. You saw what you got for Risto Line and Granite. That was a different situation, even though he wasn't signed to any extension yet. Obviously, Philadelphia planned on signing him to an extension. Um, but with that being said, like he's still a right-handed defenseman. Colin Miller's a right-handed defenseman. That's a, there's a huge value for players like that, especially at the deadline. Um, and Colin Miller isn't a defensive liability as much as nearly as much as Rasmus Risto Line was. In fact, I think he's worlds better in his own end than Rasmus Risto Line was and is. And the guy like that, you know, you already have a lot of assets or a lot of stock in the in the first round of this next draft. I think we have three picks. Um, I want to say it's three. I could be wrong, but um, you could you you could add another pick to either this next first th- th- this year's first uh, round or maybe the following years, which is the big uh, you know anticipated Connor Bedard uh, draft. Yeah, I, I I'm gonna let you know right now about the the drafts um we have oh no 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 sorry apologize this is, profe- this is professional podcasting people professional <laughs> i'll get it in a minute um we but got it. i know it's at least two uh first i think one is the one from vegas that can be pushed yep. back um but one, one, one thing the Reinhardt, to... the Reinhardt and Risto Lion and trades each got us both each each got us first round picks. So one of those, I'm pretty sure, is the next is in this next draft. So with that being said, um, I know a lot of people were were 
Oh no, here it is. I have it right here. Yeah, we have this year we have um our own Florida's and Vegas. Um they're both conditional. Um if Florida's pick is in the top 10, the pick will be exchanged with 2023 and Vegas if the pick is in the top 10, same thing. They'll both go to 2023. Um and you know that's we have three second rounders in 2023 as well. So like just looking at that, if we're able to add another one, even if it's a second rounder or you know for something at the deadline, you know to have five picks inside the first two rounds, um, or you know if Vegas continues to struggle. Uh, it doesn't look like Florida is going to, you know, get a top 10 pick. But, you know, if Vegas continues to struggle, who knows? I don't know. They're dealing with a ton of injuries right now, too. So, And, you know, they don't have the depth at goaltending the way they used to before they traded Mark andre Fleury, obviously. So, um, But, you know, with that being said, uh, obviously we have a second guest on tap. Uh, I know, Cully, you were, you've been pretty busy with big game goaltending, uh, you know, we don't hold it against you for sometimes you can't, you can't hop on whenever you want to. Uh, we don't hold that against you. Obviously uh, you're teaching the next, uh, the future goaltenders of uh, North America uh, doing a service, a, a service to the hockey community for sure. My and, kids any, any, too. Hey, hey, hey any, any, any names you want to pump real quick before we cut the, the, the Cam Robinson interview? Yeah. Uh, one being Mac Musty, um, Dawson Bagley, um, Liam Feeney, um, you know, three younger goalies. Mac Musty obviously is, is the, the younger sister of Quentin Musty. She is um, playing uh, for the Regals boys, triple a SCTA team, which is, you know, the Regals SCTA and the junior Sabres are the two top teams in the area for a, for a girl at, at 13 to be playing uh, at that level, I think is special. Um, I think she has a chance to, to be, not only a division one player, but like a future Olympian. Uh, and I, I say that with a straight face, she has that much potential. Um, just a warrior in the net. Great, great technique technically. And the other two I mentioned um, have been a great year. Uh, you know, Bagley and Feeney are, are both backstopping um, the power city Bruins 07 team. You know, they've beaten some triple a teams. They're ranked in the top uh, 10 in the country for their double a um you know, bracket, uh, but, you know, they're coached by Mike Suda, um, father of one of our former guests and current Cornell freshman, um, Michael Suda Jr. So, um, you know, I love what I do. I'm, I'm very thankful to do it. I apologize to the fans for when I'm not able to get on, but, you know, it being my full-time job, you know, my kids got to eat. So um, I'll let you tee up the, uh, the, uh, the next part of our, our show here, but it's been fun to get back on and, um, uh, you know, real quick, let's do our predictions. I got Buffalo winning uh, four to two tonight with an empty netter. Um, I think I, I like that prediction a lot too. Um, I think that actually, I think Buffalo is going to really take advantage of a struggling. I mean, they've won one in their last six, so and not not that Buffalo has been much better, but uh, I'm going to predict that Buffalo comes out you know hot, and I think I'm going to predict a five to one victory tonight. Um, I think it. you're going to see a big night out of uh, guys like Darlene and Cousins, um, and you know I, I hope I hope Colin Miller continues to keep playing at the pace he is because again let's uh, increase that stock at the deadline. That's all I care about, baby. You know, hey, uh, get, real you know, quick, one I didn't mean to interrupt you, but what when with Yo with Joker back, is there a reason why he isn't was he would not put right back with with, with Darlene? Yeah. Um, because him and because Darlene and Pissick were playing pretty well together uh, after they took Will Butcher out of the lineup. So, and he, I, 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 Darlene even said he, you know, he gives him helps him play a more calm game. Uh, you know, helps make his decisions, especially offensively, easier. Uh, you know, he's not hesitating. So, and I've noticed it too in his game as well. So, um, I think it's funny. I it all goes full circle. Uh, Dwayne loves when I tell these stories, but the the one year I got to go to Sabres training camp. That was the year that we drafted Mark Pissick in the first round. And he was actually my stall mate. Nicest fucking guy in the world. So down to earth, real chill cat, but, but just a, you know, very talented skater. And, um, you know, it's just interesting how it all comes full circle. 
Uh, he was nothing but great to me, and he didn't need to be. You know, he was the first round pick that year. I was an undrafted free agent, you know, local kid. You know, he could have shit in my ditch, and I, you know, I couldn't have done anything about it. Well, instead, he, you know, he treated me very, 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 very fondly, and I have nothing but good memories of that. And I'm glad to see him back here playing great hockey. And, you know, uh, I'm just excited for the future, man. Just following along Owen Power and, and Michigan's success and him and Portillo. Yeah, um, they play and, tonight too, I believe. Yeah, and seeing what what's coming through the pipeline, I I don't remember having this much excitement or interest in following along our prospects, whether they be in Rochester or in college or in major junior than ever before. But um, uh, I my my last thing is uh, hats off to JJ Paterka. I know we have you know Krebs and and Quinn getting a lot of the talk down there, but he he's having a hell of a playing his way in, into, into the lineup for next year. And uh, it's going to be fun to see all of them have. I yeah. Think all of them have. He just brings a different element. I've been a fan of his ever since I got to watch him play every game for Germany um, mm-hmm. with, with Stutzel. Stutzel. Stutzel, yeah, yep. that's been fun. So, um, you know, looking forward to a good game tonight and uh, good to be back on for episode 78. And hopefully I can be back on for episode 79. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I'll let you uh, tease the outro for uh, what's next. Yep, we got Cam Robinson coming up here from uh, Elite Prospects. We had a phenomenal conversation with him about uh, you know the future of the Buffalo Sabers, from Peyton Krebs to Jack Quinn to uh, Owen Power. You know, a guy who again, as I mentioned earlier, is really making a run at the Hobie Baker. I think this season, twenty points in fourteen games. We had uh, some good conversations about Eric Portillo. Uh, you know, another guy in his second year. Um, I don't think he was a redshirt freshman, but. Uh, um, just another guy who's really kind of put himself, I think, in my opinion, I know we're a little biased on this show, but um, I, I think kind of may, maybe put himself first in the conversation when it comes to who's going to lead the way for this franchise as, as the future goaltender, I mean, the franchise goaltender, uh, the kid from Sweden this year, uh, you know, is holding down again, playing in a very difficult division, uh, in the big 10, a two, a two, three goals against and a nine eighteen save percentage. Um uh, but I, you know, I, I believe they play tonight. And then you, yeah, obviously we talked about, as I mentioned before, Peyton Krebs, JJ Paterka, Jack Quinn, um, and just the possibility. And you know, we were really in depth about this next, uh, the depth of, uh, this next NHL draft in 2022 that, you know, the Sabres might be playing themselves out of maybe getting, you know, you know, contending to, to win the lottery for Shane Wright. But there's a lot of other great names out there that are available. And we discuss them, uh, in this, uh, interview. And I'm going to tee that up right now. Uh, Cully. Uh, always been a pleasure, buddy. Um, and, you know, we will talk to you guys next week. Here is Cam Robinson from Elite Prospects. And welcome, everybody, to our uh, interview with Cam Robinson from Elite Prospects, Director of Video Scouting. Uh, I absolutely uh, uh, excited to have you on with us, Cam. Uh, thanks for hopping on. Yeah, happy to do it, man. It's been uh, been a while in the making. I'm glad we could find a time. Yeah, we have been playing a lot of phone tag over the last couple months, man. Uh, I know we both had some issues with scheduling and stuff, but definitely happy to finally get this done. Um, you know, I slid in, you know, kind of slid into your DMs and actually come on. What was it about me like a four or five months ago now? I think. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something we, like that. Yeah, we, we had we had the same good idea for a tweet or something like that, and it hooked it up. So yeah, that's what it was. Kismet. Pretty, that's what it was. Yeah, uh, but mm-hmm. great world of Twitter. Um, uh, speaking of which, um, before we uh, get right into it, you know, I was, uh, kind of, uh, perusing your timeline and I saw a lot of interesting things, uh, you know, that I definitely want to bring up on, uh, during this interview. Uh, one of which, um, you know, I know that a lot of the hype right now is around Shane Wright being at the top of the draft. And I obviously want to get your input on him, but with the way the Sabres are playing right now, um, you know, we were projected to possibly, be historically one of the worst teams probably you know not just it you know in the league but just, you know you look at that roster that we put out to start the season you're not thinking anything but you know this team's gonna have the best chance to win the lottery once again and maybe not so much because Don Granado has these guys competing every single night even against the te- the league's best teams they, they have wins against both teams that competed in last year's uh Stanley Cup final granite Montreal has been a dumpster fire but they have a win against uh, against Tampa Bay. They only they lost only by one to teams like the Rangers, the the Boston Bruins. Like they're, they're not getting they're not getting boat raced every single night, other than the other night against Calgary, uh, five nothing. But uh, that's going to happen, I think, to every team at least once or twice during the season. 
But uh, they, he has them competing. So now as a, as a Sabres fan, I'm kind of looking at, you know, projections of, you know, players that are eligible for the 2022 draft. And I'm not even looking at Shane Wright's name anymore. Uh, one of the players that you just recently wrote about, uh, uh, Connor Geeky, is that how it, the pronunciation? Yep. Connor uh, Geeky. Another, one of the guys that's not getting the hype that uh, obviously a Shane Wright does, but definitely want to, you know, touch on him uh, with you for sure. I, I guess that after perusing your, your timeline and other names too, that aren't getting that Shane Wright hype are like guys like Logan Cooley and, Frank, uh, again, Frank Nazar, is that mm-hmm. kind of pronunciation? Yeah, I would yep. get used to that. But uh, just to kind of get your uh, your outlook, your your viewpoints on maybe outside of the top three, you know, what who are the types of, types of players that might fit into that mold uh, for the Buffalo Sabres and what they're trying to do? Uh, especially in my opinion, I think they should be, they're looking at le- absolutely down the middle for sure because they have a lack of depth at center right now. Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, I, I've been I've been really impressed with how hard the Sabers have played this year. When I've been checking in yes. and, and catching their games, it's they they are buying into the system. And you know, like you said, they're not getting boat raced every night. They are playing tight defensive, and they're they're really good counter attacks too. Um, with the limited talent on that team, um, it's it's been I've been impressed for sure. And that's with Rasmus Dahlin not probably playing up to the level that we many expected him to take that step this year too. So. Um, pretty impressive. I think you're absolutely right. They shouldn't be in the mix for right unless they get super lucky and grab one of those, you know, 4% balls and, and pull at the top. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, down the middle, you kind of hit on, you hit on some of the big names there, right? Logan Cooley. Um, we can talk about Connor Geeky right off the hop because he gets a lot of love and I think that he's going to go early. Um, so he's six foot four, maybe even close to six foot five, super skilled kid plays the middle of the ice, you know, those type of uh, ingredients often land you very, very top of, of the draft class. And so right now it's still the Shane Wright draft. And then it's kind of a mixed bag. It's, you know, it's going to fall under team preference. Obviously we have a lot of hockey left to play this season, um, but players are going to hopefully start to separate themselves. But, you know, we have our first EB ringside um, draft board meeting here this weekend. And like the talk has been endless on our group chat. Is that like, we don't like, I know who I want to put at number two, but like it's wide open in that two to 10 range. Um, so when, when you're looking at Connor geeky, like I said, he's got the size, he has slick, slick Six. hands, like some, some of the better hands on him in the draft class. Uh, the big question mark with him is skating big, big question mark. And so if you look at that at my pinned article on my Twitter page there, yep. um, I go in, I kind of go in and I go hard on him for the first, you know, thousand words on his skating. And, and there's a lot that needs to be cleaned up there. Um, it impacts his pace. He plays at kind of this slow hunting pace, but when he gets the puck, he does a lot of nice things with it. It's just, he's probably going to piss a lot of coaches off as he moves up because he's, the feet aren't moving all that effectively. Um, it reminds me a little bit of a player like Kirby doc in his draft year, um, mm-hmm. a similar big body guy, lots of skill, didn't play with a ton of pace, went third overall. Uh, you know, Cody glass, another guy who probably had more pace, maybe a little less skill, but all these guys, they're big players, big centers that don't really use their size to their advantage, um, as much as they could, uh, especially at the junior level. And then you want to see them use it at the junior level so that they translate and bring that up. And, and, you know, it's not as easy to do it in the NHL against, uh, you know, full grown men, but if you're six foot four, and you're weighing 215, you should still be able to manhandle some NHLers as you get your man strength. So I want to see a lot. Uh, I want to see a lot more pace, improve that skating. And you know, I talked to some people close to Geeky, and like he spends a lot of time thinking and working on his skating. And so you know, I was at a game a couple weeks back, and he was just stretching out the ankles. Um, my buddy Mitch Brown was saying the same thing. He saw him, and he's just always working out the ankles, trying to stretch it out, get that ankle flexion because that's a big hindrance for him. Um, so he's one of these kids that I think is going to go early. Um, and then the upside is big, uh, but there is a, a scenario where he kind of ends up being more of like a third line center because he's really strong defensively. He has a good stick, but I'm not sure the foot speed's going to allow him to get up into that number one, number two center. Um, so that's kind of the breakdown on geeky. Um, you know, talking Logan Cooley, I like him a lot, a lot of pace, you know, it's kind of the inverse of geeky. The kid plays with a ton of pace. It's frenetic. Um, not as high skilled as a player, but, um, is still quite skilled. Um, you know, Frank Nazar might be the more talented player overall, but takes more chances and kind of doesn't always make the right decisions. And so you have to kind of pair that together. So those are probably the big three right now, uh, down the middle, uh, that are going to be going, looking at at the top 10 sort of thing. Um, and then there's, there's, uh, you know, there's some guys that, 
you know, Yaroslav Kovsky that he has played a little bit of the middle of the ice. Another kid who's like six foot three, six foot four. And, uh, you know, if he, if he was a better skater and he played for sure, the middle of the ice, he's another one that I think would be a locked in in the top five, top six. So a lot of hockey left to be played. We'll see where Buffalo ends up, but I think you're right. I think they should look down the middle of the ice. This isn't necessarily the draft to get it unless you're picking at the top. Um, but we'll see. Yeah. You know, uh, last, not this, uh, past draft, but the previous one, the, the Jack Quinn draft, a lot of, we had, um, oh God, uh, Torigny, you know, now head coach with the, the Coyotes. He, we had yeah. him on pre-draft and, you know, we, cause you know, Buffalo was uh, picking at that uh, the eight spot, I believe it was, and you know there was a lot of talk about surrounding Marco Rossi being the top center available in that draft, most NHL ready player. And then you also had Jack Quinn on that team that there was some smoke around the time when we when we interviewed him, uh, you know. And granted, Jack Quinn has been playing phenomenally at the AHL level uh, over in Rochester, but you know it was a head scratching pick at the time because you you wanted to. As I've always said, and I've said in the show multiple times, is you know one of the best ways like to sustain success in this league, you have to have depth down the middle. Like it's it's so difficult to sustain you know success over a long term when you don't have that depth and have three lines that could you know, three scoring lines, and we just not haven't had that in a very long time in Buffalo, not since the days of Daniel Breer and Chris Drury, and uh, you know that was a big head scratching pick for a lot of people in my opinion including myself that marco rossi was sitting there and you passed him up for jack quinn uh you know and but it, it, it's starting to look like it's working out in the, the ahl he's playing phenomenally but uh you know this draft for me for sure it has to be a center um like unless you're picking way later in the draft which i mean grant again as well as they're playing under don granado uh i just can't see them probably you know slipping outside of the top 10. Yeah, which which means they're going to get a good pick, right? Top ten, top ten is going to afford you a good pick. This is a good draft. It's better than twenty one. Um, I think it is comparable to twenty, maybe even better than twenty two. Like there's some upside guys. There's a lot of good defensemen. Unfortunately, you guys are pretty stacked up on the back end, yes, so that are. won't be able to you too too much. Um, but that is that is kind of the real the real impact I'd say in that top top 15 is is that there's a ton of really good really good right shot defensemen which is kind of a rarity these days. Um, but you know, looking at Jack Quinn, that Marco Rossi, like I was. I was pretty hard on that pick um, watching the 67s that year. I, I don't think it was, I don't even think it was a question who the better prospect was on that team. They yeah. played a part. Jack Quinn still scored 50. Like he, it's not like he's a bad player. He's a strong defensive player. Yeah. Obviously the shot is an incredible weapon, um, but the playmaking, the vision and the IQ, those were big question marks for me. And he's, he's put that to bed a fair amount um, going off what I have seen of him in Rochester. And, you know, just talking to people who know, um, is that his his vision? He's not just chucking pucks in blindly into areas anymore. That he's that he's improved that, and the shot remains just lethal. So you know, being in the top two or three in AHL scoring as a twenty year old is nothing to sneeze at. I know that they're trying to work him into the middle of the ice. I've never seen him as a center personally. I've always long term saw him as a as a winger who could play on either side on his off wing and come down and fire it, or on his strong side. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll see if that experiment works out long term. Uh, I still would have taken Marco Rossi just because I think yeah. he's so dynamic that he could be a guy that could hit, you know, sniff triple digits one day in the right situation. Um, but I do think that it's taking Jack Quinn at eight has, has broke about as right as you could hope for up to this point. Yeah. You know, last year it was, I know we had a, a kind of like, again, you know, and you, you can speak to this too. It was a very, uh, um, very odd, you know, year for attempting to scout and, to really, because you can't really be in ranks uh, last year to really scout these players that you kind of like were so dependent on video scouting um, and to really get a good look at, you know, what, what the steps that Jack Quinn was going to take, you know, because, you know, obviously he didn't go back to Ottawa. He stayed here uh, in Rochester and, and he struggled. He definitely struggled uh, his first stint with the first year with Rochester, but kind of seeing him take the steps in the right direction has been a breath of fresh air. Granted, like you said, I, I, I tend to agree. I think Marco Rossi is, you know, levels better uh, than, than Jack Quinn, but um, it is a, like a breath of fresh air to see him succeeding under Seth Alpert in, uh, in Rochester. And I, I mean, I'm not going to sit there and say that I, you know, on, on a team, a team like the Sabres who, you know, will at times find, have difficulties and will struggle to find scoring. I, I think the granite granite, what they're doing right now is nice and everything, but I just don't think it's sustainable. 
Um, I do like the fact that they're letting him sit there and marinate in Rochester. I wouldn't even mind it if they allowed him to do that again next year, uh, mm-hmm. keep him hungry. But uh, outside of him, man, we have a lot of other a, a lot of other players that we're pretty excited about. Uh, you know, obviously, top fit list is Owen Power in Michigan. Uh, we actually had him on as well pre-draft. Uh, I think it was like two weeks before the draft, and the kid is a very bright a bright guy. Uh, you know, I'm extremely excited to see you know what he brings to the table. I'm hoping we could actually see him in Buffalo, maybe for a few games after his season with Michigan is done, depending on how well they do in the. Uh, in the uh, uh, NCAA, if they if they do end up winning a national championship or get knocked out early, not that I'm rooting for him to uh, to, to not win, but we'll see what happens. And then uh, guys like JJ Paterka, who were taken in the second round uh, uh, the previous year, uh, and obviously uh, newly acquired Peyton Krebs in the Jack Eichel trade. Uh, I know we spoke a little bit on Peyton Krebs, and you have a lot. Uh, to say it in regards to him, you know, what, uh, you know, what do you know about Peyton Krebs that we as Sabres fans don't know yet? Yeah. So I'm a big, big Peyton Krebs fan. And so I, I think I had him ranked seventh or sixth, even in his draft year. Um, it was criminal that he fell as far as he did uh, to the golden Knights there. And it was purely because he tore his Achilles before mm-hmm. the draft and nobody wants to draft a guy who's going up on crutches, but it's like <laughs> that injury is going to heal and he's going to be the player that he is now. And we all see it too. Um, so I, I think that that was an excellent pull for the Sabres, especially for a team that needs some help down the middle. Mm-hmm. He's going to give it to you. So playmaking, you know, he attacks defenders with purpose. Um, he's he's more pace and skill than he is deception, but it works. Um, I think his shot has long been kind of a deficiency for him is that, he, you know, it's a, about average mechanics, um, but he doesn't, he doesn't fire it as much as he should. And that's starting to come with him a little bit, or it was anyways in the AHL to start this season. I haven't watched him since he moved over to the Sabres organization, but um, defense, big strength for him. So he's, he's advanced in his reads. So he supports and he battles extremely well. He's always involved down low. Um, he can generate those turnovers with his high tempo and his scanning and, quick feet, quick hands. I love his pace. You know, he plays with great, great pace. He backs off defenders and then he uses that skill and that pace to really, he can work and maneuver the puck with his great puck skills too. So um, I think he's a high level player. I think he's someone who has top center upside, but is a very safe bet to be a number two center for your club. Um, He's, he's a great player. I'm a big, big fan of his. And then, you know, you talked about Owen power is that I, I had a hard time with Owen Power throughout his draft season because I, like everybody else, saw the potential. It, it's mm-hmm. it's there and it's it's it was magnified in that draft class because there wasn't really some standout players. Um, I ha- I ended up putting him number four on my board because I liked the upside of some of the the other players. I put Brant Clark, Mason McTavish, and William Eklund ahead of him. I still feel pretty good about that, um, even though he's just torching the NCAA right now. I think he, you know he's top five in scoring as a D man. Um, he's on pace to be one of the greatest, you know, U twenty scoring defensemen ever in that circuit, which is which is very impressive. But it also is speaks to the level of skill that is on that Michigan squad too, right? Like you you slide um, him over to, to Northeastern so or, or or you know BU or any other program basically this year, and he's probably you know you're shaving five or six points off there, which is still awesome, right? Like that's what I said. I want him to go back to Michigan and put up a point a game looks like he's going to do you know 1.2 yeah. or something like that which is awesome so he's stepping forward he's going to be monstrous for Canada at the world juniors he's going to be a great defender I think he's going to just be a menace defensively my big question mark was whether he's going to be able to put up the points to justify a first overall pick I thought he was going to be like a safe 30 35 point guy who's just going to smother defensively and be heavy on the retrievals yeah. and heavy in front of the net and that's that's going to be great for you guys too but if all of a sudden he can be a 45 50 point defenseman then now you, you know that's butter right that's going to be great it's it's who's going to play the top power play minutes him or Darlene, right and so if it's me it's probably still going to be Darlene, and that's going to keep his point total lower uh, long term but his value is going to be great so i think those two like you mentioned are, are definitely the, the the crown jewels in the organization right now i think i think when owen start, really started to turn a lot of heads and started to justify himself being at the top of that draft was at the world championships right he is playing mm-hmm. with men uh and you didn't really get a good look at him at, at, on the international level before then um i know he played a lot of juniors and then obviously his first season his freshman year with, with michigan uh but he really stood out uh, you know, a, you know, a boy amongst men uh, at the world championships and just really, you know, that's when I was really convinced that this kid is the real, the real deal. Uh, and just again, how, how well he performed. And then you see this season again, when we had him on, you know, a lot of Sabres fans are just, you know, they're losing their minds because 
and it, it's never happened with a first overall pick, you know, them, you know, choosing to stay in college for three years and then, you know, come be a, a free agent. Uh, that's the, one of the biggest things that was, was happening here in Buffalo, that narrative that, you know, do we sure we want to take this kid, you know, Buffalo is a shit show, you know, he, why would he want to come here? But, you know, I truly believed him when he said, you know, yeah, I just, I, you know, I, I, I'm choosing probably to go back to, to go back to Michigan because look at the team we're bringing back. Like you had that brass ring in front of you and then COVID happens and you had to pull out of the tournament, you know, and you were probably the, you know, the most, the most favored uh, favored team to, to win a national title of the year to have that taken away from you uh, that that has to sting a lot and I, I you know, when he said I wanted to go back to, to a to further my development and B you know you have veneers coming back Johnson coming back Hughes is going to be, uh, be uh, coming into his freshman year uh, all these all these phenomenal talented young hockey players I don't blame at all for wanting to go back go get a ring man it's going to do better right. for you playing you know 20, 20 plus minutes a night with Michigan than it is here you know struggling on a team maybe you know we were expecting to be a lot worse off than we are right now but be struggling on a team that you know probably isn't going to win a lot of hockey games yeah without a doubt and and you know that's on the hockey side of things and then just like considering the personal side of things is this is a kid going to a major university that's a life experience right and he and he landed there for COVID, right where there's no fans in the barn and there's not that whole atmosphere around you know they're probably doing online classes and stuff like this like yeah go back i wanted all those guys to go back veneers johnson all of them i thought go get your university experience especially on this squad that life experience that you only get it once you know like and then it's over and you step out and it's you know now you're accountable now you're in the pros and you're getting paid the big box and it's it's a job Right now, it's a job too, but it's there's some fun times. We'll be sure a kid. Boys are having to exactly right. Be a kid, so I don't. You know? I heard that narrative too that like, oh, he's gonna stay and and go the UFA route. It's like, no, no. he's not. There's no, no way not. he's gonna hamper his development to stick around college for years that he doesn't yes. need to be there. Like he's stepping out at the end of this season if it works to go to Buffalo, or it'll be the beginning of next year. Yeah. Um, without a question, like I would put my mortgage payment on it, no problem. Yeah, it, um, it's it's stupid to think otherwise, and especially not even just the cut. You're playing at Yoast. Like that, that yeah. arena in itself, man, to have you to, to, I would want just the rivalry Michigan state series alone with the fans and, and how wild those games can be uh, later on uh, after the new year, we're actually uh, probably going to go to Michigan for a Michigan, Michigan state game, just to check that nice. out for the experience. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm super excited for that. And, you know, we have Eric Portillo in that who's having a phenomenal year uh, in his sophomore season, a kid, uh, another another kid that we had on, had on with us, and just you know th- this prospect pool that Buffalo has, especially in that you know between Uka Pekka Lukin and um, uh, Eric Portillo and Devin Levi, you know things are looking good for Buffalo. Finally, you know because we I, I I remember I I, I broke it down uh, after um, between Miller, uh, Dominic Hasek, and Ryan Miller. I think we had maybe four or five, like four to six total starting goaltenders in between those two guys. To, to start a game uh, in that for Buffalo between Miller and now I think we're close to 30, like 30 different starting goaltenders. We haven't been able to find the guy. Uh, it, it, it's, it's embarrassing. And, you know, finally like we look at a pool of goaltenders uh, personally in me, for me as, as you know, even though Uka Pekka is performing well uh, in Rochester at the AHL level, I I'm looking at guys like Eric Portillo top my list, Devin Levi, who are guys who are going to be the really honestly be the future franchise goaltenders of this team. Really exciting stuff. Yeah, they've got three darts. I honestly, I, I feel like they have three darts at it, and you got to hope that one of those is going to hit. And I think you're right. I think Eric Portillo, a lot of people are sleeping on him. Like why? he's, uh, uh, why is right? Like, is it, you know, they think the stats are inflated because of where he plays, but like, I liked this kid. Like, I had him in the top 60 in his draft year in 2019. I thought he was a really interesting player coming out of the USHL there, put up good numbers for Dubuque. Um, well, turn of the year, I think, too. He might have been, yeah. And and you know, you look at it now, like he's he's put up great metrics at Michigan. He's six foot six, like two twenty. You can't see size. Exactly right. That's what you want to see from your goal. Like those are those are gonna be bonus points coming up. Like Devin Levi's highly skilled, but he doesn't have those size metrics to really back no. him up. So he's That's gonna have to be elite. 
he's number three on that list just purely on his size and some guys can do it like you know uc saros has did it it takes a little bit longer like mikey di pietro in vancouver looks like he could do yeah. it um but it's still a long road ahead so i'd say with you know upl and uh and then and then portillo that you got two good bets of one of those guys breaking right and being above average average nhl goalie and then you got levi who i think is a longer shot but has the skill to maybe get there and, and kind of break the mold so i think you're absolutely right that's that's got to be a real priority a real hope anyways there's no need to go and get somebody now they got three you hope one of them can get there maybe you get yourself someone who can stop gap it for a little bit until it, it works out for one of them but uh but no i i'm i'm a big fan of of eric portillo me me too man and like getting to speak to him a couple of times and i t- i i have the uh, i text him every now and then the kid is just he's such a likable guy like he's such a likable guy uh always smiling he's always having fun uh and you know especially when you in this sport and at that position if you could always be smiling and always be able to find the bright side of things and not get in your own head uh i mean that just adds to the intangibles of being you know a franchise goaltender because uh, again like you said if a lot of people do sleep on eric and i don't understand why the kid is six foot six he's two inches bigger than upl who i mean i don't understand upl as of last year was uh, you know, our top rating goaltending prospect before we went and acquired Devin Levi in the uh, Sam Reinhardt trade. But I've always been, you know, had Eric at the top of my list because the size, the athletic ability, and just that drive to continuously get better and just seeing the steps he's taken as a freshman to now and what I expect him to do from now until next year. I mean, he's just going to keep getting better. And I, I, I truly do believe he is the next future franchise goaltender of this team. And I even tweeted it out the other day. I said, you know what? I mean, as good as Devin Levi has been, um, or I'm sorry, as UPL has been, um, I get worried about the injury history. He has already had double hip surgery. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's had a couple of injuries under his belt. It does worry me a little bit, especially at the position. As a goalie myself, my co-host is a goalie, uh, you know, know, having that many issues with your hips this early on, that's going to be problematic down the road, I think. Um, oh, I think I think for without a question, right? Like yeah. you look at the numbers too, right? Since it, it's been a struggle for him to come back, those yes. double hip surgeries are no joke. No and joke. It will take years, right? Like uh, Thatcher yeah. Demko went through it. Like these guys go through it, and there is a bump in the developmental path when yeah. they when they hit that, right? And I said I, I said it myself, and I said I know this is probably an unpopular opinion, and honestly, that has nothing to do uh, with him or what I think he could be. But I said maybe Buffalo at some point, if he gets a little bit of on a heater here, should look think about possibly moving a kid like him to try and get uh, get more picks in these next two drafts because of how deep and how good they are. I, I I I'm I'm not advocating for it. Like yeah, we have to trade him, but like you know, I just I don't trust the injury history. You know, the mm-hmm. ability to play you know play oh, 50 plus games over an 82 game season. It's just it's a, when it comes to your hips as a goaltender to have that many issues early on in your career. It's just I, I just don't see him playing a full full career as a as a number one goalie in the nhl yeah and and then you got to ask the question too is portillo is going to come out of school next year and, and you want to get him starts if he's your guy right like is that if there's a log jam there yep. you got to get enough starts you got to get you know it's great to have a battle if you have two young guys mm-hmm. fighting for it and they're both doing well then that's great situation but um at some point you know one guy is gonna have to separate himself and really take the ball and run with it and so you know eh. Yeah, you want to get his numbers up if you want to sell them because you want to be able to Absolutely. sell them to somebody as like this is an asset, not not just a bargain bin. You know, here's a fifth or sixth rounder yep. for this kid, and, and and maybe he does break right and it, it sucks for you later. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, you mentioned it earlier about about Rasmus Dahlin too. You know, kind of like is off and on struggles, uh, and I I really attribute that a lot to mismanagement. Uh, you know, you know he, the kids already had. In the three years he's been in the league, he's already had two head coaches, two general managers. Like this, you know, since 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 Lindy, since the this ownership group, the Pagulas bought the team, they're now on their sixth head coach and fourth general manager. Which I don't understand how you expect any team to be successful with that kind of turnover at those two positions. It's it's damn near impossible. Uh, and just kind of like again, the, the shit show it has been for Buffalo between losing Sam Reinhardt, losing Jack Eichel, and just you know, j- just you know, just the constant, constant sitting in the basement. But you know, you look at a guy like Rasmus Dahlin, you see the potentials there to be a stud franchise number one defenseman. Uh, do you see him taking those, you know, taking those steps under Don Granado? We think we finally found, uh, okay, you know, with as in football terms in Buffalo, our Sean McDermott. You know what I mean? The guy who turned the bills around, you know, we hope yeah. you, you see Darlene yeah. taking those steps. 
I want to, like, I've long held the belief that he is one of the most skilled defensemen on the planet. Like he mm -hmm. should be hanging up there with Kale McCarr and Adam Fox right now. Like he, yep. he if, I, I believe if we went to an organization, that's the level we'd be talking about too, is that he'd be one of these kids that would be putting up monster point totals and building his defensive side of the game at the same time too. And, you know, we saw it like his first two seasons, like he was first 18 and 19 year olds to put up those type of numbers in yep. 30 plus years. Um, he was on track to do it. And now, you know, the defense side of things was always going to, you know, kind of lag behind a little bit, just the type of player he was. Um, but now the numbers are falling off too. And so I don't think that this is a, a lost cause by any means. I think we're, hopefully this is the right coach for him and, and this is the system and then it can surround him with the players needed to, to get that confidence up and to build into it. And so by the time he's 24, 25, hopefully you still got yourself a number one defenseman. Um, Cause that's what he should be. I think it'll be, it'll be a waste. It'll be criminal if he ends up, you know, not living up to his potential or even close to it. And he ends up as like a four or five guy. I think that'll just be, it'll do be a travesty if that's what happens. Yeah. I, I don't think that happens with him. Honestly, I I'm looking no. at his numbers and, and his course C4 is over 50%. Uh, his offensive zone starts, you know, over 50%. Uh, you know, this is definitely as, and maybe not in the terms of what you would want. I mean, he has 10 points in 17 games. That's nothing that like you, you know, to sneeze at, like you said earlier, but uh, you know, for the first time, I know plus minus is a very misleading stat, but he's, he's in the positive and the plus minus for the first time in a while. Um, so I, I do look at this season as granite uh, defensively in his own end, I think is where we, we, we really, you know, struggle. With him, uh, especially you know, there has been a couple times where he's got absolutely walked one on one, got caught puck watching instead of you know maybe putting the brakes on and getting a piece of the puck carrier, just got walked right around for goals. But I, I do have, I still have a lot of high hopes for him. Um, and I do, I, I do drool at the fact that it, you know if and when you know I think when he does finally kind of start to reach that ceiling, that glass ceiling that you know we all originally thought that he had. Uh, the thought of him and Owen Power on the blue line together is like a lot of fun to think about. Oh yeah, you, you, you're going to have him out there for the majority of the game, right? Like that's yep. going to be that's We're that's going to be awesome, right? Like that's yeah. that's going to one one guy's going to be smothering the other guy. Hopefully, should be you know running a rough shot, and and so that should be that should be good times. And that's and that's what you need, right? Like that's that's what you need to get that the organization to level jump and and to be you know more serious rather than like, hey, look at this fun run that they're going on. They're not getting just mm -hmm. tuned up every night. Is that you want to take step forward? It's been it's been a rough go for the Sabers. I I feel you, you know, I've been uh, cheering for your expansion cousins now for the last 30 years and it's been pretty rough times in Vancouver too. Um yes. apathy sets in, you know, after the anger and then and then it's just like, well, we suck. What's what's the Canucks, to do? Yeah. You know, so it's so you need your best players to be your best players long term for things to turn around, or else it just it just sets that rebuild back three, four, five years again. Yeah, it it, it's, it sucks, man. Because like you know, a couple of years ago when we had drafted Darlene, us as Sayers fans, we were drooling. Like you know, we were kind of looking at the blueprint that the you know the past Chicago Blackhawks teams and you know LA Kings teams kind of kind of put out there. You know, you you start by finding your your guy up the middle, your franchise setter, and then you find your you know you find your guy in the blue line, your cornerstone, number one defense. You had them both finally. And then, mm. you know, all the, uh, the, the, the dumpster fire ensued over the next few years. And it's just been absolute misery for a while now. But uh, before we let you go, I did want to ask you, I know we touched a little bit on Shane, Wright, But uh, can you, can you give us, you know, your overall breakdown of who Shane Wright is? And here's, here's one question for me. Where do you compare him to, you know, if, if if the if got an Alexi Lafreniere who is struggling with uh, the New York Rangers, you know where 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 does he sit on the level of guys like them in their draft year, or even Owen Power uh, in his this last year in his draft year? Where would you put him uh, in those in if they were all to be I guess in the same draft class? Ahead, at first, 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 first. Um, uh, I I would probably have a hard time not putting Shane Wright first. You know, like I guess there's an argument maybe with Jack Hughes in 2019, um, Darlene in 2018, you know, 2017, I'd have him first, uh, you know, just because, you know, guys like Pedersen and McCarr hadn't really shown themselves to be that level at that point. Uh, but he's excellent. He is excellent at basically everything. It's I look at him kind of like Patrice Bergeron on steroids. Um, so he is so nuanced defensively already for his age. Like it's, it's crazy, um, how strong defensively he is that it, it almost, 
it hind is so far this year what i've watched anyways it's it's kind of hindered him blowing up and having those monster point totals um so he got robbed of having last year's draft minus one season but you know he paced better than mcdavid um as a as a 15 year old um as an exceptional status kid he's not that level of talent in the sense that he's not that he doesn't have mcdavid's game breaking speed with the puck on his stick but exactly. you know across the board yeah right so hockey <laughs> sense though i've we had elite prospects we run a nine point scale when we're when we're assessing players we've never used a nine for anything for skating shooting passing puck handling hockey sense physicality anything we've never I, not that i've seen anyways and i've been there this is my third season with the he's got a nine for hockey sense he's that level of smart and so you know i had quentin byfield number one on my list in lafreniere's year I and that's not a, yeah that's not a huge not i like that yeah, we're very few and far between us but uh you know lafreniere mm -hmm. is a good player i'm surprised by his struggles this this season um not so much last year uh but he, he, I don't even think it's comparable with the upside. I, I honestly, I, I see Shane Wright as being that guy who's going to play 20 minutes a night, all situations, and he's going to impact the game in so many different ways. He's, uh, you know, a great skater, a well above average skater, shooter. His passing is excellent. His puck handling is excellent. You know, maybe the the lowest grade for him is his physicality, and it's still above average because um, he, he just he plays everything so, so well. So I think he's going to be a dynamic player, whoever lands him, Arizona, in, you know, unless, unless oh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the god of luck, uh, you know, doesn't smile upon them. Um, so it, it, it happened, he's it happened to us player. in the McDavid it, draft. It happened oh, to man. us. <laughs> it does. It, it's, it seems like it happens almost to every bottom feeder, unless it's the Leafs with the Matthews year or whatever. Right. Um, oh. is, is that if you, if you bought them out, you're supposed to get that guy. Oh. Right. I remember when they bottomed out and got Matthews the, the year before, you know, we, we took so much shit because we tanked purposely to get, you know, for the McDavid draft, we got what we deserved. We didn't get McDavid, blah, blah, blah. And then the Leafs, like, we we're taking so much heat from up north. And then the Leafs fucking did it worse than we did. <laughs> and they got, and they got Matthews and not, not, not a chirp from them. So, no, um, well, of course, no, right. It's true. Yeah. No. I, uh, I, you know, with Quentin Byfield too, like, I, 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 I too was one of the few of our between, like, I, the guy is huge. He reminded me so much of not an exact comparison, but when I watched him play, I thought of Eric Lindros. I, I, a guy you just can't teach that size and that type of you know I'm not saying he's a violent player but he can yeah be. and the snarl from the yeah. net and just you know I thought of him like dude like that's you know I'm not saying that's his ceiling but if that's who I'm thinking of when I look at a player like that you know I don't know how you didn't put him at one and again to be able to skate the way he did with his size and just the overall natural ability and just like you said his high high hockey IQ I was like man I just I, I thought. The Rangers were crazy for not taking Quinn. Not not crazy because they got a great player, even though he's struggling in, in uh, Lafreniere. But you know, I thought they were crazy for not taking Byfield. Oh man, and LA just like waltzes into it, and that prospect yeah. pipeline of oh, theirs is just God. so deep. But like the, the the high ankle sprain this year obviously is is knocked Byfield out for a bit, which might yeah. be a blessing for Team Canada if they decide to send him back for a little tune up with the World Juniors, yeah. um, where he should just be a force um, but i think the, i think the world right. is going to kind of wake up to that you know the likelihood because i took a lot of shit for that putting by field all year i, 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 me too. I had my field there too I, actually yeah. I, I was on a vancouver uh podcast uh when i when i when i said that and i don't think you guys are crazy i think my field's number one they all thought i was crazy yeah oh yeah i took the heat all year but you know what you, that's what you do right you, you you take your assessment and you stick with it and mm -hmm. then you wait 10 years and see who is smart yeah right but uh cam thanks a lot for coming on with us man uh you're an absolute wagon and this booty look at that hair by the way look at that fucking hair <laughs> I, I actually hear you know uh, right, sometimes I, I put it down but i got i got, I got, I got oh nice yeah myself yeah nice nice I, it, it, gets, it, it gets too much in the way dude uh yeah but i, I, so yeah. I have to keep it up for uh for most of the most part but definitely absolute wagon a solid head of lettuce uh thanks again for hopping out with us cam i appreciate yeah, it i appreciate it man yeah lots of fun yeah, absolutely. And then this is, again, this was episode 78 of Two Goalies, One Mike. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. And, you know, we'll talk to you. I think it's a 78. Yeah, it's either 78 or 79. Well, I'll, I'll figure it out. But uh, <laughs> um, thanks. You know, we'll, we'll talk to you guys again next week.